afternoon, everybody. We're ready for the final session. Um, wonderful uh, participants. We are going to break from the program. There's something that's not on the program, but we're going to have a little presentation from uh, our own Climate Justice Alliance members uh, who have a report for us and a statement, and they're going to tell about something they just did. I understand they made a floral delivery to somebody who deserved it. And uh, you ready, Ananda? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, once again, my name is Andres uh, Felipe Hernandez, and I work with uh, our mountain corporations, and this is a statement that we proceed to uh, give. This Sunday, over 400,000 people marched on the streets of the New York City in solidarity with communities around the world living on front lines of both climate change and this exploitative system and driving this planetary crisis. Thousands more took direct action yesterday by floating Wall Street to target the polluting corporations and their fi sorry, financiers profiteering from such global harm. Today, as world leaders at the United Nations Climate Summit 2014, we, members and affiliates of the Climate Justice Alliance, duly note that these climate arenas are taken over by corporate agendas that continue to onslaught of business as usual, the global expansion of fossil fuel development rather than action to cut greenhouse gases at its source. Hello, my name is Judith Nieto. I come from Houston, Texas, and I work with an organization, uh, Texas, Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Services. And this is what I, I said. <laughs> Um, in place of genuine climate action, the UN Climate Summit 2014 is little more than a pep rally pushing carbon trading offsets, offsets and weak voluntary and limited pledges for emissions, emission cuts leading up to the global climate treaty negotiations in Paris next year. Today, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon stated a goal to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by 2020. On the surface, this appears good. In reality, it is thinly veiled language for the promotion of market-based and destructive public-private partnership initiatives such as Red Plus, Climate Smart Agriculture, and the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, which will further exploit human and natural resources to expand the profits of the world's most wealthy. Hi, everybody. I'm Mehdi from uh, Morocco. I work for MCMO, is in a Moroccan network, Euro Mediterranean uh, space, and also partner for global coalition on migration. As communities first and the most impact by the storms, floods, and drought, we are also at the forefront of the fight against the pollution, the poverty the police violence, the land grabs, the water shutoffs, the forced migration and human rights relation symptomatic and the climate crisis. Which is why our communities are uniting for a just transition away from the dig, burn and dam economy and towards local living econo economies that meet the material needs of people and where communities and workers are in charge. Once again, my name is Jahan Giron with the Black Mesa Water Coalition coming from the Navajo Nation in Arizona. For decades, we have been cultivating real solutions where we live, work, play, and pray. Our solutions define a new system that moves us away from an economy of endless growth that exploits people and nature to one that seeks harmony between humans and nature. We need a system that links climate change and human rights, that recognizes the rights of indigenous peoples and the self-determination of frontline communities. 
Our planet, Mother Earth, and her natural resources cannot sustain the increasing greed, consumption, extraction, pollution, and waste associated with the 1%. We require a new system that addresses the needs of the majority and not of the few. To move in this direction, we need a redistribution of resources and a new definition of well-being and prosperity for all life on the planet in recognition of the limits and the rights of our mother nature and earth. We demand that world leaders support and move money to our community-led priorities and local infrastructure needs to build sustainable community economics, energy democracy, zero waste, food justice, public transit, and affordable housing, pathways that can create millions of long-term jobs and put our communities back to work. We support indigenous uh, peoples, our brothers and sisters of the North and the Global South in their climate justice struggles, linking land and water rights, land title, and the full implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Candy Masse. I'm a Mandan Hidatsa Arikara woman from North Dakota. I work with the Indigenous Environmental Network. I um, am one of 38 civil society folks that were allowed inside the summit out of 544 people that wanted to go inside, which is rather disappointing. It was also disappointing being inside listening to our president, Barack Obama, tell countries to come forth, to stand up, to come together to address climate change, while going on to say that the United States is only committing to 17% in reductions of emissions by 2020 from 2005 levels. He was followed by China, who went on to talk about how they were committing $6 million to the Green Climate Fund whereas others were contributing billions of dollars. And so, since I am able to go back to the summit, I'm going to take this statement with me. Um, my daughter, Ayana, is gonna stay with her daddy because she isn't even allowed inside, even though um, most of those people that are in there making those decisions on her behalf won't even be around when she's old enough to have to deal with everything that they're making decisions for her. And it upsets me, but it's good to see all of you here. I'm glad to for the Climate Justice Alliance. And I just want to say, whose power? Whose power? Whose power? Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. We're gonna, we're heading into the home stretch. Um, we have some, some wonderful speakers. I'm not sure if they're all in the room. If you are here, come and identify yourself because I don't know what all of you look like. Um, so we have, um, I know that Maris Grecias is here. Miriam Miranda, estas uh, presente, esta bien. Stanley, we know. Uh, okay, Melina Lubacan Massimo, you're here, great, okay. Michika Muende, are you here? He may get here yet. Um, Mitika, you're here? Okay, so we're going to, um, we're going to start with Miriam Miranda. Mi nombre es Miriam Miranda. My, is, my name is Miriam Miranda. Eh, soy del pueblo Garifuna de Honduras. I'm from the Garifuna people of Honduras. Somos un pueblo caribe ubicado en la costa atlántica de Honduras, la costa caribe de Honduras. We're on the Caribbean coast of Honduras, on the, on the northern coast. Quiero compartir con ustedes eh, una situación que está pasando y que está enfrentando el pueblo garífuna. I want to share with you all a little bit about a situation that we are confronting as garífuna people. En el 2008, la tormenta tropical Gama azotó Honduras y 70%, una de las comunidades, 70% de una de las comunidades garífunas se convirtió en desplazados ambientales. 
Uh, there was a situation in 2008 where the tropical storm Gamma uh, uh, ended up displacing 70% of a Garifuna community who are now uh, environmental exiles. Las comunidades garífunas, por estar ubicado en la costa atlántica, eh, estamos enfrentando un grave problema que casi no se habla, que es el tema de la sedimentación y que está afectando todos los pueblos que viven en la costa caribe. Uh, we, we, the Garifuna people, we live on the Atlantic coast and we're confronting a grave situation um, that has to do with the sedimentation. Nuestra organización, que se llama o la Organización Fraternal Negra Hondureña, eh, inició un proceso de reocupación de un territorio de más de 1,200 manzanas de tierra que le pertenecen al pueblo garífuna. Um, I belong to the fraternal, uh, the organization uh, Fraternal Hondureña, uh, which is in a process of trying to reoccupy uh, 1,200 manzanas. Acres, acres uh, of land currently. Este proceso de reocupación se inició con el propósito de reubicar o instalar las personas que están siendo afectadas y que están saliendo de las comunidades porque están eh, perdiendo sus casas y su hábitat producto de la sedimentación del mar. Uh, this process has been started by uh, uh, finding, find, re, replacing the people that have been leaving their land, who are losing their homes and also uh, their food sources. Eh, eh, ¿Cuál es el problema? Este territorio que es nuestro está siendo también acaparado por personas del crimen organizado que están dedicados a la narcoactividad en Honduras. Uh, what else is happening? In, 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 in our territory, we're also facing a situation of uh, being infiltrated by organized crime. En la situación y el problema de la narcoactividad se ha convertido también en una forma de despojo y de acaparamiento de territorios en muchas de las comunidades y en muchos de los países de América Latina, cuando esta gente que tiene mucho poder económico para invertir se convierten muchos de ellos también en socios de estos proyectos, de los megaproyectos que están desplazando las comunidades. Uh, the, the, the narco trafficking has resulted in um, a large... Uh, Uh, it has resulted in land grabs, and it's a situation that we're facing in Honduras and in many other countries in Latin America. Um, and there's also people who are economically well off who are working together with these mega, mega projects that are coming into our communities. Y en nuestras comunidades en este momento enfrentamos una, dos grandes retos. Por un lado, Estamos saliendo de las comunidades, la gente está saliendo de sus comunidades, de las casas que han, han habitado frente al mar, pero cuando quieren ubicarse más al sur, se encuentran que las tierras están ocupadas y acaparadas por terratenientes, por personas ligadas al narcotráfico y también porque han sido entregadas nuestros territorios para las industrias extractivas, como la, en el caso de Honduras, el tema de la minería, incluso para las represas. Uh, our communities are facing two challenges in particular. The first one is we're having to leave our homes um, that are, where we've always lived close to the sea. And the second problem comes when we, we've tried to move towards the south um, and the lands there we're finding are occupied uh, by landlords, by narco traffickers, and also much of that land has been handed over to uh, expropriative industries um, that are uh, extracting from the land. También te, enfrentamos otro problema y es que el 80% de las comunidades nuestras eh, tenemos alrededor mo, monocultivos, siempre mon, monocultivos, en este caso palma africana, que ya hoy día lo están también impulsando como parte de, de los eh, procesos, proyectos red. E incluso en el caso de Honduras, uno de los grandes empresarios de este país que ha violentado los derechos humanos de los campesinos, he sido una de las personas beneficiadas de los de los red, ¿verdad? Y es el que tiene más de 27 mil hectáreas de tierra sembrada de, de monocultivo de palma africana. ¿Cuántos hectáreas? 27 mil. Uh, so one of the problems is that about uh, 80% of our community is now covered by uh, monocultures of African palm, uh, Afri uh, for African palm to, um, I don't know what the red project is. 
Oh, it's just, this is called the Project Red, and, um, and, and in Honduras, uh, some of the, some of the uh, major leaders of this effort have been the ones that have been violating our rights, and they're the ones that are making profits through the system of red, and they've expropriated about 27,000 hectares of land. Los red están generando hambruna en nuestros países. Se está dejando de producir los alimentos básicos para producir eh, eh, monocultivos palma africana y están utilizándolo también como una forma de acaparamiento y militarización y criminalización de los movimientos y de las comunidades cuando nos oponemos a ese tipo de producción. Uh, we've, we've had to stop cultivating a lot of the, the things we use to cultivate to be able to, to feed ourselves, to be able to produce this monoculture African palm. And um, they, they've used this as an opportunity to militarize and criminalize us when we, and they, and they have started to criminalize us when we build social movements to fight back. Uh, finalmente, eh, quiero decirles que ante toda esta problemática estamos resistiendo. Tenemos comunidades en resistencia, Estamos ahí enfrentando, incluso enfrentando un poder que es tan difícil enfrentarlo como es el tema de la narcoactividad, eh, que sabemos que están secuestrando muchos de los países de América Latina el tema de la narcoactividad y el crimen organizado, pero ahí están las comunidades resistiendo, utilizando nuestra cultura, nuestra identidad, porque creo que la resistencia de nuestros pueblos también no debemos de perder, que tenemos que fortalecer hoy más que nunca nuestra identidad, la colectividad, tenemos que demostrar que la solidaridad es muy importante en nuestro pueblo como una forma de, de resistir a, ante un empate capitalista de, como estamos enfrentando hoy día en este mundo. Uh, so I just want to let you all know we're, we're resisting and we're confronting the powers that be um, and, and we're confronting very difficult powers to confront like the narco traffickers and these are people who have been kidnapping our country, countries and, and kidnapping our, and taking our land. Uh, organized, the organized crime is difficult to fight against, but we've been using our culture, our identity as a form of resistance, and we've been uh, reinforcing our, our struggle through solidarity with others um, because this is the only way we can fight against uh, capital, capitalism. Finalmente, darles las gracias eh, por darme la oportunidad. Sabemos de que es más difícil cuando tiene que haber traducción. Eh, así, pero igual, yo creo que es importante que haya venido desde esa parte tan pequeña hasta aquí para poder compartir con ustedes nuestra experiencia y que todo este conocimiento también podamos utilizarlo en nuestro trabajo del día a día en nuestro país. Muchísimas gracias a todos ustedes. So thanks to all of you. We know that this is always a little more difficult uh, to talk about when there's uh, interpretation going on, but this has been, a, a, you know, very important for us. And you know, to come from my small place and, and to come here to to share and talk about what everyone's doing and gain this knowledge uh, is something is something very important for all of us. So thank you very much. Yes, yeah. Hi, our next speaker is from Kentucky, Stanley Sturgis. Uh, he's going to tell us a little bit more about coal from the inside track. Good to see everyone here. My name is Stanley Sturgill, and I am here with a group from Kentuckians for the Commonwealth to try and create a new and better climate and climate change. I'm a retired underground coal miner I'm 69 years old, and I worked in the coal mines for 41 years. I now have black lung disease as a result of my many years in coal mining. I live at the foot of the highest peak in Kentucky, Black Mountain. My home is located in the tiny Appalachian coal camp of Lynch, Kentucky in Harlan County, Kentucky. My wife and I have three children, three grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. And my reason for being here today is because I want to build a bright future for my family, for my Appalachia, and for the entire world. I have a vision where my children and grandchildren can have good jobs that support all our families without doing damage to our water, the air we breathe, stopping the blasting of our lands, and stopping the destruction of our environment and climate. 
But this future is really uncertain in our southeastern Kentucky area. Every day my family and I must watch as our beautiful mountains, our drinking water, and our surroundings are being blasted away by the coal companies right before our eyes. But most important, all this is killing our people everywhere in our area. Every day we must breathe the air that continues to be poisoned by the coal companies that care nothing about our health and welfare. I have lived at the base of the Black Mountain most of my life, and to me, this mountain is sacred. All mountains, especially the Appalachian Mountains, are sacred to me. Sadly, there are no mountains in the entire world that are sacred to any mining companies. The only thing sacred to them is the money they make from blasting away the mountains. Our Appalachian Mountains are not only being raped for its coal, but also for its gas, natural gas and oil and wood. I liken the coal companies to oil, uh, the coal and the, I'm sorry, I liken the coal companies, the oil companies and the gas companies. In my own terms, they're like mountain terrorists. I feel I'm justified in this name based on the weapons of mass destruction that they have no problem in using to extract my mountain's fossil fuels. They use the massive rock drills, use millions of tons of explosives. They use the enormous rock hauling trucks, the giant front end loaders. Yeah, these are weapons of mass destruction and they're real where I live. They're not just fiction. Our people continue to pay the price for all this as we have done for nearly a hundred years. But all that makes, but all this makes this bright future I yearn for so uncertain in my southeastern Kentucky. I'm also here because our political leadership has failed us. In Kentucky, our leaders have sold us out from our local and state politicians and all the way up to the Kentucky representatives in our National Congress. So I'm here to call upon all these leaders, no matter what level or whatever they represent, no matter what country that rep that's represented across the street from us, all these leaders, we need to tell them that those of us at the front lines of the crisis or at the forefront of change. It's not going to be an easy task, but we believe we can do this. We know together we can build a bright future. I feel that's why I'm here, and I, I, you know, I hope that's why you're here too. And as we lead the way, we demand that all of our people, our uh, leaders, looking, uh, start looking beyond fossil fuels, coal and what have you, and start representing the people that elected them to office, not the corporations that own them. Join us now and never forget, we are our own best hope for change because we are dying, and I mean literally dying, for their help, your help, in this change. Thank you. So I'd like to call on um, Ashim Roy, who's here from India, from the new Trade and Union Initiative. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about labor and uh, a lot of the things that, were, that are very important to us, a, new, a just transition as, as work goes, as we get rid of dirty jobs, how we're going to start transitioning over to cleaner jobs. Uh, and he has a lot of other things to say to us. So uh, we're really happy to have him here. Um. <laughs> Uh, I'm Ashim Roy. I, I'm part of the an alternative labor movement in India, uh, which is linked up with a large number of social uh, movements in India, and uh, organizing both the formal and the informal sector. And I'll speak more specifically about the the front line of those uh, energy transition issues 
that confront both the working people and the communities where they're involved in. Uh, more specifically, I'll be talking about and giving some testimony of the coal workers or the communities where the coal mining is taking place. Uh, first, uh, that you know there has been a fair amount of governmental effort to see that the expansion of coal takes place, expansion of coal mining takes place, primarily because for a country like India, where more than 200 million of people are still without electricity, more than 200 million people are without stable electricity in the sense that they don't get for 24 hours electricity. The question of power is an important factor in their lively, in their life, and in, for their livelihood. So it's in a country from from a country's perspective and from a developing country's perspective, power and energy is an important factor. And yet we are aware of that that we are faced with a climatic change framework. We are faced with really this country is not doing effort, and the amount of work that needs to be done to see that the transition takes place. And it is in this context that we are really grappling with the complex problem of transition. And it is in this, uh, it's in this perspective that I would like to really share that in the last few years or the last decade, in many, in most of the areas, actually the government has failed to really expand the coal mining sector. In a large part of India where there's a coal mining taking place, it is actually, in many ways, the communities, and I would come back to the, those communities working in the, as contingent workers in the mining area, where the people have actually resisted the coal, coal companies and the government from taking over the land. So it's actually an anti-displacement movement, which actually also, in many ways, is the working people's movement. As a union movement, which was always building, always built on the idea that once the community, once the mining has come into existence, and a union's job is to just do collective bargaining, and we know the declining rate of unionization in most of this country, we were one of the few unions which took a proactive stand and decided that we will join the anti-displacement movement because we we thought that it is important that we fight that battle and build a bridge between the communities where the mining is taking place. And once the mining displacement takes place, those people in the communities become the destitutes, become the working people who live in contingent, who live in low wages, who live in destitutes in that area. So we are, so it's in our view, we believe that in organizing their anti-displacement struggle, in joining the communities in their struggle, we win their confidence and win their allegiance to really see and make them realize that they're also working people and they have to fight for their economic justice. And it is in that sense, the economic justice and the climate justice are kind of are merged in those kind of struggle. This is one aspect of that struggle. The second aspect, which is a much more complicated and much more difficult, is that we are still grappling with the problem of what is a transition. We, it's, a, it's a very, very important question. 60% of our power comes from coal. We are still a country where 80% of the people live in in rural areas, in poverty. Their livelihood is dependent on many, on many factors, but one of the factors is that you can't increase their productive life without creating generation, without creating energy and power for them. And yet, we have to make this transition of trying to see that the government's overprojection of power, and that's a three-point framework that we have. We want to really contend with the government's idea of what is the requirement of power in, those in, in, in our country. So we are challenging it every time, both in action and as well as in larger policy forum, that the power projection, the need of the power for a country like India is overinflated. We don't need that power. The power is being used for different reasons, and that is how the communities are getting organized. The second is the consideration of equity. We are organizing those people around the right to electricity. We believe that if electricity has to be produced, they have to first reach the marginalized people. They need to reach the people who don't have electricity. And that's how we really build the equity from the very beginning of this energy transition. And the third and last point is that we are also trying to ally with all those forces in creating struggles to support what we have decided on a solar energy or renewable energy, but very clearly asking in large areas, supporting movements, supporting communities to build off-grid the, this is the trade union, not just community organization, trade unions which are supporting and building 
with the village workers, with the rural workers, and supporting the off-grid solar energy systems. And we really want to take this back and build up also urban movement along this line. So in a broad framework, what we believe that it is our responsibility as a trade union organization, who are in the forefront of such a, of communities which are really facing the brunt of of, uh, of, of, this goal, of this transition. I can go and add more about other areas. But this is, the, this is how we look forward to it, and this is how we are really campaigning and building a movement for it. We are a part of a larger, trying to build a change of discourse in the international trade and movement by saying that we require an energy transition, and not energy transition in future, but energy transition now, and that we are ready to make commitment and ask for a fair transition for the workers who are in the in the, in, in the, in the coal-intensive industries and power generation, but at the same time believe that the renewable energies industry has to be built up, and so we are fighting for industrial policies and seeing that the workers in those sectors are organized and they have a claim in this energy transition. So that's the broad idea and the broad sense of how the movement and how the people are fighting. In, and, I, and I believe, uh, and I was really inspired, I just want to share that it was a great inspiration to be here on Sunday. I really want to thank every one of you who have been, who made it successful. And I really want to believe that we all are in solidarity and we'll be together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashim. So our next speaker is very local, uh, and that's going to be Damaris Reyes from Goals, good old Lower East Side here in New York. Damaris. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, I thought about how what I needed to prepare uh, to talk about what we went through, um, and I couldn't really put anything onto paper, so I'm just gonna speak from my heart mostly, um, and I might read a few things. Um, first, let me tell you that I, I am a lifelong resident of the neighborhood which I serve, the Lower East Side, um, and I work in the Lower East Side, and thank goodness that I work for the community that I live in, because it made a significant difference in what we were able to do uh, during Hurricane Sandy. So I, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the disaster and what it meant to us. Um, most of the, uh, a good portion of the Lower East Side is in an evacuation zone, evacuation zone A. And when Hurricane Sandy was on its way, you know, we were told to try and evacuate as many people. Uh, so we went around with bullhorns and we tried to encourage people to leave and go to the city shelters. But most people felt that they didn't believe that the storm was really coming and that it was going to have such an impact, especially because the previous year during Hurricane Irene, a lot of people left the community and the, the impact was not as great. But on October 29th, uh, we were quite surprised when the Con Edison plant exploded three times um, and the water started to rise and come in from the river and surround many of our buildings. And really, it made its way all the way almost to Avenue B. And if you know this neighborhood, then you know that's quite a ways from the river. Um, in some places, the storm surge was five feet. In other places, the storm surge was 14 feet. And it was quite a moment for me when my children yelled um, at me and said, Mom, the cars are floating. And we never thought we would ever see anything like this. This is Manhattan. This is New York City. What could possibly go wrong here? They're going to have everything you know, secured and taken care of. Um, but that was not the case. Um, so I also want to stress that in this neighborhood, um, nearly 70% of the population uh, that is impacted by a storm or st storm surge, surge um, live in public housing. Um, and, you know, disasters, as we know, tend to um, typically uh, impact people of color, low-income people, more than they do their affluent counterparts. And that was indeed the case. Our power left. We had no running water. We had no heat. We had seniors trapped in high-rise buildings. Sorry, I always get emotional. Um, and um, so immediately, 
many of us had to figure out what do we do about these folks? How do we help them? You know, even the government aid responses were inadequate. Uh, they, it's not like they were going door to door. It's not like they had come right away. So many of us organizations like Goals um, had to come together with our volunteers, with our members, and figure out how are we going to serve these folks. And, you know, at, during that time, Goals was able to manage 3,000 volunteers and reach 15,000 households. And don't ask me how we did it, because I really don't know how we did it. i would never organized anything so large in my life, but, you know, in the moment of crisis, you just respond. That is what you do. And so it was our community that really saved our community. Right? It was not the help of government officials except for some of our local elected officials who are also rooted in the community and did everything that they could for us. Um, but this really raised a lot of concern for us as we move forward because even though many groups were working to, uh, out there and trying to reach folks, what we realized was we weren't talking to each other. We weren't communicating with each other. We couldn't because our cell phones weren't working and our landlines were down. So we were all kind of in our own silos doing whatever we could to serve and save the people that we we could. And just to give you an example, we went into one building and we found a person who was wheelchair bound who did not have electricity and had an electric wheelchair that was not functioning for two days and so they had not eaten. This is the kind of stuff that we bumped into that we saw that really moved us and made us decide that we were going to take our future into our own hands, that we were going to come together as a community in a well-coordinated way and so we formed a network called LES Ready. And LES Ready is made up of about 31 different organizations. All of us have come together to do three things, to serve any of the unmet needs that are still lingering, to de develop a community-based disaster plan. While we know we gotta coordinate with the city, we also know that in the time of a disaster, it's gonna be us who's gonna be responding. And the third thing is to mitigate, to find, um, to develop mitigation practices and solutions so that we can lessen the impact. What have we done? We have recently partnered with some, uh, uh, um, the, the Rebuild by Design, which is a federal competition. We got about $335 million so that we can um, put flood protection strategies along the East River. Um, we are also developing in-house a local uh, emergency preparedness network, which will have communications, which will have alternative energy, uh, and will also serve to uh, bring down some of the carbon emissions. But these things all cost money. Um, money which we don't necessarily have. And so while they're great ideas and while we are, you know, finding that there is a lot of support, there's not generally a lot of support in the terms of resources. So we'll see what we, what we get to accomplish. But what we know is that, you know, our community is what saved our community and that there needs to be a, a the government and other sources need to look at these community-driven solutions and invest in them and understand that in the time of disasters, which is, you know, which we now understand are caused by climate change, that it is us that they need to support and it's not the other way around. You know, I cannot express to you how hard it was to get any information from our government counterparts, who knows where FEMA really was, and any of these other agencies, and even after the disaster was over, and people were trying to get financial help. They were not able to get the help that they needed. And so, you know, I, I wanted to tell our story, but I also wanted to convey that, you know, we need to support community-driven efforts because in the end, we really are the first responders. Thank you. And I just want to say this last thing. We are all traumatized by this impact. And Jay, who's sitting right there, you know, who's really taken the, her work to the next level and working on environmental justice issues, um, we cannot forget the trauma that we experience. And so these moments are critical in helping us get through and move forward. So thank you. Thank you, Damaris. So now I would like to call on Melina Labacon Massima from the Cree Nation in Canada. Are you here? Tansikia, Nia, Melina, Mio, Wapin, Labakan, Masmo, Nia, Nihiao, Kinas Kuntanawao. It's really good to be here today. Um, my name is Melina Miawapin Lubokan Massimo, and I'm a member of the Lubokan Cree First Nation, which is one of the many communities that are impacted by tar sands extractions. Um, that's where my family lives, and that's where I was born. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about tar sands extraction and then pipeline resistance and um, where to go from there. 
Um, so I'm from one of the three deposit areas. It's a really huge area that we're talking about. I think a lot of people now know um, that it will be will become one of the biggest industrialized projects on the face of the planet if we don't stop it. So what we're talking about is 141,000 square kilometers of extraction. And that's equivalent for folks that don't know kilometers. It's, we're in miles country, I guess. But um, it's equivalent to destroying the size of Florida. So that's where our homelands are. So this is the area that we're talking about. And when we say the tar sands, that's what we mean. That's the immensity of the projects that we're facing. We're dealing with every multinational corporation you can think of is in the tar sands. American, Canadian, Euro European, Asian, it doesn't matter, they're in the tar sands. I come from one of the communities that um, until my generation lived very sustainably off the land. Um, my Kukum and Muslim, who weren't even English speakers, they only spoke Cree, they lived their whole lives off the land, hunting, fishing, trapping. Um, you know, they didn't go to residential schools until my dad's generation went to residential schools. And my dad, I was actually hid from the Indian agent, which was forcibly removing the children off of the land into residential schools. And so my generation is actually the first one that doesn't, you know, do all the fishing, hunting, trapping, even though I go onto the land still with my family. Um, the latest, just to give people an idea, the latest mine that's being built is Imperial Oil, so an American company. It will be equivalent to the size of Washington, D.C. when it's all said and done. So we're talking, that's just one mine alone, and we have seven mines in the Athabasca region, and we have 100 underground mining projects currently, and that's only 2 to 3 percent of what we already see as tar sands extraction. They want to develop it till 2050, till, you know, from 100 years till now. Um, tar sands is the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions in um, Canada, and so that's that's why we see, slow down, okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm just trying to get it all in there. But um, tar sands is, um, where was I? So tar sands is one of the fastest growing sources of greenhouse emissions in Canada, and that's why we see um, corrupt governments, governments like Harper, you know, refusing to even come here today to deal with the issues of climate change and the irresponsibility that they have um, in creating climate and exacerbating climate issues worldwide. Um, to explain for people in the future, tar sands, um, there's underground mining and there's there's surface mining. So those are two very um, exploitative types. And what we see with that is the toxic contamination that comes out of both of them. Um, right now, we see hundreds of square kilometers of just toxic sludge that's being released onto the landscape as we speak right now today. All, you know, for 40 years it's already been. So that's the toxic landscape. We're talking about cyanide, mercury, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, nymphenic acids, lead, mercury, all of those things combined just as a toxic sludge cocktail that um, communities, you know, it's being released into the watersheds. Um, it, it's, not, it's only kept in, it's not actually, it's only kept in by soil. And so as we know, you know, when you build a sandcastle, it, the, things like to move in the aquifers. And so we know that currently every day um, it's been predicted that, or well not predicted, but estimated that um, 11 million liters is being leached into the Athabasca watershed, which connects to where I'm from, which is the Peace River, Peace Athabasca Delta, which is a sixth of Canada's fresh water supply. And then that's going into the Mackenzie River Basin into the Arctic. So we're all connected in these issues in the north. But what also connects us is the pipeline issues, as you probably are more well aware of, which is the Keystone XL pipeline. Sorry, slower. So the Keystone XL pipeline, which I think has brought about more of the um, issue to Americans, even though Americans are now, we're now your number one supplier of oil, which I think a lot of um, American folks don't realize. And um, that's, you know, coming from our homelands. And so we are, we are seeing in our homelands environmental and cultural genocide. Um, people are becoming more and more afraid to utilize the land, live off the land, harvest medicines, fish, hunt. We see tumors on fish. We see tumors in the carcasses of, of moose. My dad, who's a hunter, um, when he went hunting a number of years ago, um, the carcass was yellow inside and three tumors inside and things like that that we haven't seen before. Um, so... A couple more points, but the pipeline corridors, I think, is what is actually giving us a base of political, a political base, which is actually creating alliances worldwide. You know, I see my brother here, Brian. He, you know, he's in the refinery area. He's, he's in Texas, all the way from northern Alberta to Texas. That's how we're connected to these tar sands issues along those pipeline corridors through the KXL and also across the West Coast. Um, First Nations across the West Coast are fighting very hard. Gateway Pipeline, Kinder Morgan Pipeline, Energy East Pipeline. 
it's like tentacles that's spreading across North America and it's destroying our homeland first and foremost at the source, but it's also going to be impacting humans all across Turtle Island. And that's one of the issues that um, we're starting to see that we see this political base really starting to develop. And um, what we really are pushing for is a just transition because a lot of our families are workers in the tar sands. You know, my family works in oil and gas. I'm one of the few people that is publicly speaking out against this. And, um, you know, what we need to see is a just transition for the workers and the unions and the First Nations and environmental groups to all start continuing to work together and continue to strengthen those alliances um, to build in the renewable energy initiatives so for people to transition to, um, you know, have all of those skills to transition to green energy. Um, and so we're looking at energy sovereignty and food security in our homelands um, currently and we really hope to start developing that. And I guess one of the last issues that I really want to talk about really quickly is um, the connection between uh, violence against Mother Earth and violence against the women. Violence against women in, in where, we're com where, we're, where we live is um, over 1,200 <laughs> indigenous, sorry. <laughs> There's over 1,200 murdered and missing indigenous women currently in Canada, my sister being one of them. And a lot of the cases of these women are going unsolved by the police. A lot of these cases, we don't know what happened to the women when they're found dead, which is what happened to my sister. A lot of these women are disappeared, and we don't even know where they are. And this is 30 years that it's been a growing case, and now we have over you know, hundreds and hundreds of murdered and missing women across Canada. And the reason why I speak about this today is because there's violence on the land and there's violence against our women and those are inextricably linked and connected and they're not separate. And so that's why I raise this, I raise this issue today so people can start seeing that when we disrespect Mother Earth, we disrespect our women and the, they're so connected. Um, and I really um, would like for people to take that home, that this is an issue that we're dealing with in our communities. We're dealing with violence in our communities and our ex exploited, um, exploitation of our women in the workers' camps and exploitation of our land. And that's, I guess, one thing that I wanted folks to also take home today. Hi, hi, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call on Mitika Mwende from the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance in Kenyan. Uh, so, good evening, everybody. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yeah, um, so um, I think my name is Mvika um, Mwenda, not Mwende. And um, I come from an alliance which has got just P-A-N, Pan, and the rest is CJA. So it is the counterpart network of uh, the Climate Justice Alliance, but founded a, a, a little earlier in um, 2008. And the process of forming that alliance was informed by the realities which you are facing here in the United States. That uh, the lady who was uh, sobbing here and those others who have, who have spoken ahead of her realize that they do not have a voice as individuals. They realize that they do not have a voice as individual organizations. They realized that they did not have a, vo a voice even in various states. They realized that they did not have a voice as single countries. So there was compelling reasons to come together so that they could enhance their voice, so that they could amplify their voice, so that they could expand their numbers, so that they could be heard. And I'm quite a person, having been in the United States, having interacted with these communities from uh, uh, New York City to Detroit, to Kalamazoo, to uh, uh, Chicago, to uh, the small organizations, little village, uh, little village uh, uh, environmental organization of, uh, of Chicago, to uh, um, uh, organizations in, uh, in, in Michigan, and those others. We realize that we have a lot to, to share. We realize that there are people who are poor in the United States, which we did not know. 
that we realize that um, if you, um, you look at, uh, we have done before I came here, we had done a very good analysis of the countries because this meeting uh, uh, just across is supposed to bring people together so that they can have the climate action and ambition announcements in different countries. And just to quote, the United Nations uh, uh, Secretary General he expects <laughs> each country to put forth a clear vision of placing the world on a traje uh, trajectory to keep temperature rise within two degrees centigrade. So I went there. I was one also of the privileged one who was uh, allowed, as others who were there, the few uh, that four others who were allowed to enter there. So very early in the morning, I'm staying at uh, Brooklyn, 3.53. I had to wake up very early at 5 so that I would be here by 7. And when I came, I actually was allowed. When I went there, without even taking breakfast, I went listening. I realized, in fact, I was so enthusiastic. For the first time, I will have an opportunity to shake hand with my president and the President Obama, the, the president of the, the, the biggest economy in the world. But what happened? Actually, I realized that I would be watching them from the screen. <laughs> so then the session was very, very boring. I decided that where I belong to the people. So I crossed the path and came to this side. <laughs> and so, so when I came to this side, I also had an, I thought I had an opportunity to tell Pre President Obama that you have exceeded your limit in terms of emission reduction on the limit of two degrees Celsius. You are 1,407 percent of your emission. So you are living on a borrowed, a borrowed space. As I come from Kenya, and the one, my friend uh, Mohamed Goy, uh, uh, Mamadou from, uh, from Mali, we come from countries which have less than 10, and my friend uh, uh, MM from Nigeria. So these are the realities. But now, please allow me not to talk about science. Let's talk about moving forward, because that is the most important thing. We have noticed that uh, we need solidarity with each other. I come from Africa, you come from the United States. There's others coming from all continents. We need really to work together. And this is very important because we need numbers to drive issues. These people have power, they have money. You from the community here, you do not have money. Your only strength is numbers. And I was really impressed by the, the, the match. But allow me also to critique the match. This, this, when I came here in March, I went to Upros. I again visited all those communities. There was that excitement about a match in September. And when I was invited by GDJ to come and join the people here, I thought that uh, I will find GDJ in control. I would like, I would see the voice of Elizabeth from Upros. I would find my colleagues from, uh, from, from, from Michigan leading. No, they were decorations. They were decorations in the match. I didn't hear the voice of the people. I was very, very disappointed. And so what we need really to do is, of course, ownership of this process. Let's not participate in events, because that's what an event. So where do we go from there? That's very important. And so that is why CJH, strengthening CJH, is very, very important. This, to me, is a lesson. What happened? I'm not happy about it. Because I was watching uh, CNN, I didn't see a, a, a community person speaking. I saw other people who I did not even know where they came from. And of course, Elizabeth actually was confidential when I came in March, raising these issues. So where are we, the people? So this is very important, ladies and gentlemen, our friends. We want us in Africa, we cross that path. You want us to partner with us, you want to support us, support the communities. 
we wo that is what we want. Because we want our voices to be heard. We want to strengthen our unities. Our unities is our strength, and we are going to work together. In so as to that, when we con con converge in Africa, we converge from others, then we are going to be heard. But unfortunately, already what has happened is somebody has picked that that 400,000 people was my group, I'm the one who mobilized it, and that's all. So eventually, you know what happens. So ladies, let me give, uh, leave you with just one, one word. I want to quote a very, very uh, uh, person whom I admire. I normally like to quote that person. That is the founder of the scouting movement, Lord Banden Powell. When he was died, dying, he realized that he, no, he died in Kenya, actually, in the country. He is buried near Mount Kenya, which has been impacted by climate change. That try and leave this world a little uh, better than you found it. And when your time comes, you can die with a feeling that you have achieved your best. You may not achieve because this is a long, long journey. But you realize that uh, you have to leave a legacy like this gentleman. And so what I'm promising you, for us from Africa, me, when I came here, I got a mem. We have connected through this networking. I met my friend Momadou. I met him last seven years ago. But here he was because of this networking the guy from South Africa. All of them, we have linked, us, linked up because we have realized that our individual organizations are very small, our countries are very small, we need to work together. And that is what you people need to do, but you have to really to protect. The only way to protect yourself is to come together and strengthen yourself. I, I thank you all and thank you very much. So we're coming to the end of our, our journey together over this two-day incredible period uh, of being together. I, I want to once more thank um, the people of the United Methodist Women who were the first to believe in us. And, and they just thought that this should happen, and they made sure we had a place to do it. So thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. She's very shy, and she doesn't want to admit it, but it had a lot to do with her. Um, we're going to hear from one more speaker. He got lost this morning. And he made it here now. And so his name is Antolin Huascar. And he is uh, from a, a farming movement. He can tell you about that. Buenas tardes. Eh, muy disculpas. Del antes eh, me fui a la universidad. Y regreso, y tráfico no permitió llegar temprano. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry for being a little bit late. Uh, we went to the, uh, to, co to the college in the morning, and then the traffic was really bad when we were trying to get here. Bueno, se trata del Tribunal del Pueblo. Estamos con los jueces. Nos van a escuchar nuestro testimonio, qué está sucediendo en nuestros uh, lugares, en nuestros países, no solamente... Uh, so we're here today because of, because of the tribu tribunal. The judges are going to hear our testimonies um, from around the world. Pensé que Estados Unidos no había problemas. Uh, en Canadá no había problemas. Todo era tranquilo. Nos hacen ver Estados Unidos de viven nadie es pobre. Pero me sorprende que somos igual que mi país, pobres, excluidos, también eh, contaminados sus tierras. Uh, so, I always thought that the United States and, and Canada were very calm places to live. I didn't realize that you guys had problems. I didn't realize that you were also poor and that you were also in, the, in a similar situation to our situation. We're poor, we're facing issues of contamination, um, and, and it's the same here. Señores jueces, en mi país, Defensoría del Pueblo ha, ha, ha mencionado, hay 220 eh, se llama, conflictos socioambientales. Es decir, ese problema es eh, penalizado quienes defendemos nuestros recursos naturales, nuestro territorio. Uh, 
Um, in, in my country, there's over 220 different environmental uh, conflicts that are having a negative effect on, on the people. 25% territorio nacional ya está concesionado. Eh, casi 60% territorio de las comunidades campesinas ya es concesionado a las empresas transnacionales, multinacionales, extractivistas que vienen haciendo abuso en nuestro país. Over 25% of our national territory has been expropriated by multinational companies um, at this point. A lot of these uh, territories are indigenous ones. Y el compañero aquí estaba diciendo que se presentara, porque no se presentó. Ah, muchas gracias. Me olvidé emocionar el ver aquí a ustedes. Mi nombre es Antolín Huáscar Flores, presidente de la Confederación Nacional Agraria en el Perú. También eh, coordinador Pacto de Unidad, igualmente ahora miembro de eh, eh, Cumbre de los Pueblos frente a Cambio Climático, al llevarse a cabo 8 a 12 de diciembre. En mi nombre. Uh, my name is Antolín Huascar Flores. I'm part of the National Rural Confederation in Perú, and I will also be part of the summit. ¿Cuál cumbre? ¿Cuál es cumbre el cumbre? de los pueblos. The, the People's Summit uh, that will be taking place in December. Eh, como tiempo me hacen ver plaquita para mar, tarjeta amarilla. Por lo cual, eh, eh, posiblemente ven o no lo ven por la televisión o por medio de comunicación. Tenemos más conflicto más grave que está en Conga. Es una montaña donde está instalado una empresa uh, multinacional, un gran megaproyecto, de los cuales actualmente viene haciendo un abuso, declararon estado de emergencia, pusimos una demanda cautelar uh, aquí a, a corta uh, entrenamiento de derechos humanos, lo hizo eh, como observación, una llamada a nuestro presidente de la república, pero allá no, no tomen en cuenta, se burlan con este eh, con esta norma que se generó desde CDH. Uh, uh, so you may have seen something on TV about it, about the conflict. There's a, a mountain in our community called the Conga where a multinational corporation has installed itself and, and we've declared a state of an emergency and we've, t we've put in a, a sort of precautionary complaint within uh, uh, with the Human Rights Commission regarding the situation. Um, you know, we've appealed to our, the representative of our republic, but they haven't done anything about it. Y no entendí eso del CDH. CDH, Corte Interamericano de Derechos Humanos. Oh, and so we've, we've put in the complaint with the uh, national, international human rights court. Igualmente, hace tres años atrás, también pasó en Bagua con unas normas, un decreto supremo, mejor un decreto legislativo, Quise cambiar ¿no? las normas, con esta norma prácticamente violó nuestra Carta Magna, de lo cual generó 37 muertos entre pueblos indígenas y la Policía Nacional en nuestro país. Um, ¿Usted lo puede repetir una vez más? Disculpa, eso no lo entendí muy bien. Eh, en nuestro país, eh, cualquier ley sale a favor a grandes transnacionales, por ello... Eh, generaron un, un decreto legislativo que provocó 37 muertos entre pues, los hermanos indígenas y la Policía Nacional que justamente estaban interviniendo en esa oportunidad. Uh, in, in our, they created a ley that was uh, recently that was in favor of these transnational companies being able to come, multinationals being able to come into our community. Um, and, and because of, of this legislation, a conflict developed that resulted in 37 indigenous people uh, dying. Eh, igualmente, quiero poner aquí eh, las manos de los jueces de que Hace poco eh, se publicó, por ejemplo, por el medio de comunicación internacional de que tres, tres cuencas en la selva peruana eh, son contaminadas con derrame de petróleo. Es río Tigres, río Corrientes, río Marañón, justamente donde está nuestra bosque pulmón del mundo. Uh, and I also wanted to put it before the judges that recently we discovered that three of our uh, bodies of water are now contaminated. Uh, there are three different rivers. ¿Cuáles son los nombres de los ríos? Río Corrientes. The Corrientes River. Marañón. 
the Marañón River y Rio Tigre. and the, the Tiger River, Como Rio Tigre. Uh, they're contaminated by oil. Como estas normas, hay bastantes que generan, violan las normas de nuestro territorio, particularmente nuestros derechos de nuestros pueblos indígenas. Por lo cual, a las de tiempo, yo pongo denuncia, porque estas cosas ocurren, por lo cual afecta la soberanía alimentaria de nuestro territorio, particularmente de nuestros pueblos indígenas y pueblo en general. Uh, because of, because of uh, these standards that they've enforced, um, we, uh, the territory of the indigenous people has been affected and, and we're, putting, we're denouncing this because it's affected the food sovereignty uh, of our communities and particularly of the indigenous communities in the area. Para terminar, igualmente, están amenazando titular a nuestro territorio nacional que para ello eh, BIT, o sea, que Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo va a prestar a nuestro país 50 millones de dólares. Igualmente, hay amenaza para plantación palma aceitera, más o menos 600, 600 mil hectáreas. Esto generará problemas con estas, como les ha pasado, por ejemplo, o ventarrón o huracán Sandy, similar puede provocar con estos cambios de clima que generalmente generan grandes corporaciones internacionales. Um. So one of the things that we're facing now is put the potential expropriation of 60,000 hectares of land for the production of uh, palm oil, um, which could eventually, that this type of uh, monoculture can result in similar hurricanes like the ones we've seen here. Y usted mencionó de 50 millones de dólares. ¿Qué se trata? Préstamo para titular tierra en nuestro país. El gobierno está ofreciendo eso. Banco, banco presta, banco interamericano de BIT. Ah, the, the, the World Bank is, is offering a, a loan to these companies, a 50,000, uh, a 50 million, uh, $500 million dollar loan uh, to these companies to begin this process uh, uh, of producing the palm oil. Gracias, porque ya te estoy con tarjeta roja. Por lo cual, esta noche habla nuestro presidente Perú. Por lo cual, esta escena que la han preparado no es gratuito porque son los que han preparado, son grandes empresarios, megaproyectos de las minas que actualmente están extrayendo, son los que van a ofrecer minas. Por lo cual, y aquí pongo rechazo esa escena porque no es gratuito. So uh, that's all I'm going to say because they pulled the red card on me and tonight uh, our president of Peru is going to be speaking and they're offering a dinner, but this is a dinner being offered by some of the uh, multinational companies and the mining companies that are ex exploiting and extracting from our land. So this is not a free dinner and, and I reject it. Son, son muchos. Podemos amanecer si hay un testimonio. Tenemos bastante que violan nuestros derechos humanos, violan nuestro derecho colectivo, por lo cual, gracias por escucharme, y que el 8 al 11 de diciembre estaremos allá presentes como esta, que están acá los presidentes. Igual van a estar 185 presidentes del mundo negociando nuestro medio ambiente. Por lo cual, esperamos, esperamos también a ustedes, amigos, amigas, pues nuestra visita allá para hacer nuestro propio cumbre de los pueblos frente al cambio climático. Muchísimas gracias por escucharme. Muy agradecido. Uh, so I know there's a lot, I, I was happy to give my testimony and it was good to hear other people's testimonies and I, I wanted to invite you again from the 8th to the 11th of December. Um, we're going to be doing the People Summit on the Global Climate. Uh, there will be more than 185 uh, presidents um, and elected officials present um, talking about the environment and we're going to do the same thing we did here today uh, in, in our own People Summit. So we, I invite all of you and, and thank you very much. So thank you, all of our speakers. In just a few minutes, we're going to hear a final statement from our commentator judges who have been so wonderful and stayed all day. And they go all over the place. For, so whatever they've heard, I'm sure is going to be heard by, by more people. And uh, so, but before we um, hear from them, we have a couple mics. We think they're working. And uh, we'd like to uh, open the floor for questions or comments, especially there are many of the speakers throughout the day are still here. So uh, if you have any, we just heard a great deal of information. So if you want clarification on anything, uh, please um, raise your hand. And uh, Mike Molina, who's actually our resiliency coordinator in my Trust community, me. he's the one who's working Trust on me. our 
local evacuation and resiliency plan so that we don't get caught again. And we certainly will be meeting with uh, Damaris and, and her people soon. Uh, so anyway, raise your hand. That works. And uh, please, we want to hear from you. Questions, preguntas, anyone? Yeah, sure. And that's, excuse me, I'm Nancy Lawrence from Na sorry, Nancy Lawrence from Los Angeles, California. And I don't know if I have a, a question to ask, but but I do have a, a sort of statement because you know, I think that so many of us who came here today, you know, were tired, you know, we traveled from long distances as many of us, and we're suffering. I think a lot of us are suffering from a sense of hopelessness and alienization which the capitalist system causes. And you know, I'm concerned about some of the takeover of the climate justice movement, you know, from the, as, as the brother earlier and also the brother from Africa kind of hinted at, uh, that you know, by Ban Ki-moon and Al Gore, you know, putting on a show and, and you know, driving by, I guess, in a limousine, I think. And you know, how do we fight back if that's a good question. How do we fight back? We've got to, we got to have new tools, maybe, to figure out to keep our movement from being taken over from, you know, the, you know, the Bill Gates and the, you know, all these people, and uh, you know, basically the capitalists and imperialism. Right now, where United States is, is being, you know, it's it's going to war again. We the war is causing destruction of our planet too. So, I guess that's my statement and question. Thank you. Yeah, the question for the uh, for the last speaker is just uh, wondering if you could speak to uh, resistance in uh, among uh, indigenous and peasant movements in Peru to the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, and in light of the disaster that the uh, U.S.-Peru Free Trade Agreement has already been. Uh, muchas gracias. Buena pregunta. Eh, y uno de ellos que estoy acá y están acompañando por los compatriotas peruanos hemos sido tajante en rechazar este tratado de libre comercio Perú con Estados Unidos. ¿Por qué? Uno de ellos de que nuestros productos entre maíz, trigo, algodón actualmente ya es ratificado. Los Empresarios que vienen trayendo maíz amarillo duro no pagan el aranceles en el Perú de algodón, mucho más de trigo. Entonces, esta genera una competencia desleal, empobrecer a los agricultores peruanos. That's a very good question, and we as um, you know, indigenous people in Peru have re rejected the TPP because our products, which are products like wheat, cotton, corn, the things we produce, the businesses are now going to be able, are now being able to bring in. For example, they've been bringing in a, a, a sort of harder uh, yellow corn, a different type of corn, and this is generating uh, a system of, of poverty for us uh, because they're they're selling their products where where we were selling them before. Por eso yo digo, está acá nuestro presidente, fue uno de los de los soldados más marchaba contra el Tratado Libre Comercio. Lo pregunta está acá en Estados Unidos. Espero que me está escuchando, pues que se ratifique sus palabras cuando era candidato. Ahora es presidente, bueno, defiende a los que tienen bastante dinero. Estaba en contra. And, and so now, you know, our, our own president who's here, uh, he was against this uh, free trade agreement. And, you know, he was a soldier against this free trade agreement. And now that it's ratified and now that he's president, he's only defending the rich. Peligra porque cualquier usted empresario va a, a mi país, pues patentar. Entonces corre riesgo nuestra propiedad intelectual. Son 15 productos sensibles en esta negociación Tratado Libre y Comercio. Por eso hemos rechazado, pero pasó así. Nuestro Congreso aprobó, a pesar que había bastante protesta. Y la resistencia es fuerte, pero es penalizado. 
quien sale a las calles, somos condenados, judicializados, con, hasta con cadena perpetua. Entonces, eso lo pasamos a, allá en nuestro país. There are our, our own property is now being bought off by these businesses, and, and Congress approved this agreement, and, and now, even though we've been protesting, our, our form of protest is being criminalized, and we can even receive a, um, a lifelong sentence for, for protesting against this. El Tratado de Libre Comercio no solamente afecta a los campesinos, también a los trabajadores, a los profesionales, es decir, que a todos. Entonces, todavía no está como se ha diseñado. Entonces, posiblemente, una vez cuando ingrese con fuerza, pues va a ser, no solamente Perú tiene tratado con Estados Unidos, con Comunidad Europea, con muchos otros países, como Canadá, eh, hasta Chile, con China, y ya están firmando, eh, finalmente quieren que se, seamos consumidores, no como productores y nos mantenemos como resistencia por una soberanía alimentaria y una agricultura sostenible. Muchas gracias. And, and, and the, the free trade agreement isn't only going to affect farmers, it's going to affect work, other workers, and it's going to affect the professional people too. It's still not in full effect, so we haven't seen the full effects of it yet. Um, and this isn't only between Peru and, this, and the United States, it's also we're seeing agreements with Europe and with Canada and between Chile and China. Basically, they want to turn us into, into only consumers and they want to stop us from being producers. So uh, we say yes to food sovereignty and we say yes to sustainable act. Uh, agriculture and no to the free trade agreements. Mi nombre es Dante Alfaro de Perú. Represento a la Federación Nacional de Trabajadores de Agua Potable y a la Central General de Trabajadores del Perú, la CGTP. Your name? Su nombre? Dante Alfaro. Dante Alfaro, he represents the workers who, uh, the water service workers in Peru. So you just had one, you wanted to add briefly to what the, the uh, Antolin said. Quiero complementar eh, la pregunta y la respuesta de Antolin. Eh, nosotros no solo tenemos el tratado de libre comercio con, con varios países, el, el TPP, sino que ahora se está sumando el TISA, que es el tratado del comercio de servicios. So I just wanted to compliment a little bit what Antolin said. We're not only facing this TPP, this tra Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement, they're also trying to bring in a free trade agreement that's just about services. Este tratado eh, se está negociando por fuera de la Organización Mundial del Comercio. It's being negotiated outside the World Trade Organization. Solo Perú. Chile, Colombia y Paraguay son los únicos países de Latinoamérica que están en él. So Chile, Perú, uh, Paraguay and Colombia are the only countries in this agreement, uh, services agreement. La gravedad de este tratado es que nos privatiza el agua, la energía, la educación, la salud, todos los servicios públicos. This will privatize water, food, education and all public services. Hay una información completa en la página de la Internacional de Servicios Públicos, la PSI, WWPCI, sobre qué significa y cuáles son los peligros del TISA. So if you go to the website of PSI, the Public Sector, um, in Public Services International, you can find out about this. 17 y 18 de octubre hay un evento internacional en Ginebra de organizaciones y trabajadores sobre este tema. So uh, on October 17th and 18th, there will be uh, a meeting of workers on this issue. ¿Dónde? In, en Ginebra. That'll be in Geneva. So you can watch the website and find out more about this really dangerous agreement. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Okay, so we've had a you know, graduate program today. We've like learned so many things and I really want to thank everybody. It's amazing how many people were here all day and hung in for all day and other people came in and out and delegates were here and people from the governments were here and people from this building and people from the UN. Everybody has been here today and uh, picked up on part of this and they can all watch the, uh, the live stream. You can go to the live stream link now and go back and see what you missed or go back and study again what you liked. Uh, I'm sorry, did, what, we haven't, we're, we're finished with questions and we're going to hear from the commenters now, but oh, okay. is that okay? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, 
the energy was so great from the rally, and we've heard so many great things with the organizing that a lot of stuff would be nice to end up. It would be, but uh, we'll see what the, our uh, commentators have to tell us because, like, this is you know this is the next step. What you know what what we're uh, going to do about it, and uh, and I just want to thank everybody because my team and CJA team and all the different volunteers that worked so beautifully together. Uh, we had a real hard task because of security getting everyone in and for the most part we got them in we improvised and we faked and we you know cajoled and we did things and i think almost everybody that wanted to come in got in certainly our interpreters from the caracol uh, interpretation cooperative <laughs> who are a, a really wonderful resource certainly the people who loaned us the translation equipment because that stuff's expensive and we don't own it and uh, I'm sure there's many people I'm forgetting, uh, the people who um, work in the buildings and help us in the buildings in both sites, because we had two venues. Running something in two venues is not easy. One speaker went to another, even, pardon? Lunch, yeah. Lunch, thank you to Climate Justice Alliance for lunch. And uh, so uh, we're gonna hear from our huesis now. And thank you, Cynthia. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>